Hello, and welcome to our Intelligence Serves presentation on the 2020 cost category. This is a four-part series with each presentation highlighting one of the four MIPS categories. Today, we will give you a short summary of the cost category, explain the changes for 2020, help you understand the attribution methods, and tell you what you should be doing now to improve your cost score. For 2020, the cost category remains weighted at 15%. You do not need to submit any data for this category. It will be gathered from your Medicare Part A and B claims for the full year. Your performance will be compared to other clinicians for the year, not historical benchmarks. There are a total of 20 measures, but you will only be scored on the measures where you meet case minimum. Case minimums are 20 for total per capita cost, 35 for Medicare spending per beneficiary clinician, 20 for acute inpatient measures, 10 for procedural measures. Of the 18 episode-based measures, 10 are new for 2020. Also new for 2020, the Medicare spending per beneficiary measure now includes the word clinician in the title to differentiate it from the Medicare spending per beneficiary measures in other programs. There are also revised attribution methods for the total per capita cost measure and the Medicare spending per beneficiary clinician measure. Here is a good general summary of the cost measures with descriptions, adjustments, and case minimums. Remember, all measure data comes from Medicare Part A and B claims. Let's start with the Medicare spending per beneficiary clinician measure. Next slide, please. This measure has been renamed Medicare Spending Per Beneficiary Clinician to differentiate from the hospital spending per beneficiary measures used in other programs. This measure assesses the cost of services prior to, during, and after a patient's hospital stay. An episode includes both Medicare Part A and Part B claims, with a start date between three days prior to the hospital admission, also called the index admission, through 30 days after hospital discharge. It does exclude a defined list of services that are unlikely to be influenced by the clinician's care decisions, considered unrelated to that index admission. Again, as Kelly said, you would need 35 cases to be scored on the MSPBC measure. The newly named Medicare Spending Per Beneficiary Clinician measure now has different attribution for medical and surgical episodes. And if you want to go to the slide prior to this, Kelly, do you want to back up one slide? I think you might be one slide further ahead. There we are, thank you. So this episode, um, now has attribution has different uh, scoring as follows. So we're going to go through these steps. Step one is to define the population of index admissions. Step two is to attribute the MSPBC episodes. Step three, exclude unrelated services and calculate episode standardized observed costs. Step four, risk adjust those MSPBC episode costs to calculate the expected costs. And this accounts for Medicare patient level risk factors that can affect medical costs regardless of the care provided. Step five is to exclude the outliners and winterize the costs. This mitigates the effect of outlier high and low cost episodes on each TIN MPI or the TIN's MSPBC measure score. And finally, step six, calculate the MSPBC measure score. And next slide, please. Now, here are the distinct attribution methods for surgical and non-surgical procedures. Um, I think you went one slide too far. If you want to go back a slide, please. There we go, thank you. The first is a medical episode. And the first attributed to the 10 billion, at least 30% of the inpatient e &M services during the inpatient stay. Then it's attributed to any clinician in the TIN who billed at least one inpatient E&M service that was used to determine the attribution to the TIN. 
For surgical episodes, these are attributed to clinicians who perform any related surgical procedure during the inpatient stay, as well as to the TIN under which the clinician built the procedure. This graphic is a nice depiction of showing how what's included in the MSPBC clinician episode with the episode start three days prior to the admission, the index admission discharge 30 days past the index admission to end that episode. Okay, so let's look at an example here on the next slide. Here's an example of patient attribution for a medical episode. The first step is to look at the E&M services provided during the index admission. So this is step one on the left side. There are four TINs. The first three TINs, A, B, and C, only have 22%, 11%, and 11% respectively of the E&M services billed during that index admission. So they aren't considered for attribution for the medical episode. The fourth TIN, TIN D, has 50%. 56% of the E&M services. So this is responsible for more than 30% of the E&M services, and thus the clinician within that TIN who bill the E&M services will be identified. The patient will be attributed to these clinicians. In this example, there are five clinicians, clinicians five, six, seven, eight, and nine, who will each have one episode count towards the measures case minimum of 35 for each of these clinicians. Now we're gonna take a look at the surgical episode example. This image shows an example of the MSPBC surgical episode attribution. First, CMS will look at the CPT or HCPCS codes billed during the index admission. Next, the relevant codes will be identified, and then the episode will be attributed to the proper clinician. In this example, there are six clinicians who build a code during the index admission, but only one clinician, clinician one in 10A, build a relevant code for the surgical episode. So the patient is attributed to clinician one. Now we will look at the total per capita cost measure. The goal of the total per capita cost measure is to measure the overall cost of care for the patient. In 2020, this measure has a new attribution methodology that will help identify primary care relationships and exclude those who don't provide primary care. The risk adjustment was also refined to account for changes in a patient's health status throughout the year. Listed here are the steps for patient attribution and scoring. Step one is to identify candidate events. Step two, apply service category and specialty exclusions. Step three, construct the risk windows. Step four, attribute beneficiary months to the TINs and TIN NPI combinations. Step five, calculate monthly standardized observed costs. Step six, risk adjust these costs. Step seven, apply the specialty adjustment. And step eight, calculate the measure score. Attribution for the total per capita care cost measure begins when a clinician bills an E&M primary service. The patient to be attributed to the will be attributed to the clinician if any clinician bills another primary care service within three days, or a clinician from the same TIN bills a second primary care service within 90 days. Here's a look at how the score is calculated for the total per capita care cost measure. The candidate event will trigger the start of a risk window and all costs for the months that are in the risk window and the performance year will be attributed to the clinician. Clinicians who deliver non-primary care or are specialists will most likely be excluded from this measure. Patient risk scores will be updated monthly and the cost assessed on a monthly basis. Here is an example of how the attribution will work for the TPCC measure. In this example, the patient will, will be attributed to clinician C because they are responsible for the plurality of the candidate's events and are not one of the excluded specialties. There are 56 excluded specialties that fall into the following broad categories, surgical subspecialties, non-physicians without chronic care management, internal medicine subspecialties without additional 
highly procedural subspecialization. Internal medicine specialties that practice primarily inpatient care without chronic care management, and pediatricians who do not typically practice adult medicine. As you can see, cardiology and optometry in examples A and B fall into these exclusion categories, so the patient will not be attributed to them. The patient will also not be attributed to clinician D because they do not bill the plurality of the candidate events. Okay, now we're going to talk about episode-based measures and how they are calculated. The episode-based measures assesses the cost of care that's clinically related to initial treatment of a patient provided during an episode's time frame. These episode-based measures are either based on specific procedures or inpatient medical conditions. Listed here are the 10 new episode-based measures for 2020. There are eight procedural measures and two acute inpatient medical condition measures. Remember, you will only be scored on the measure where you meet the case minimum. As Kelly stated, you must have at least 10 cases for a procedural episode-based measure or 20 cases for an acute inpatient medical condition measure. The steps for attribution and scoring of the episode-based measures are, step one, trigger and define an episode. Step two, attribute the episode to the clinician. Step three, assign the cost to the episode and calculate the standardized episode observed cost. Step four, exclude episodes, and this removes unique groups of patients in cases where it may be impractical and unfair to compare the cost of caring for these patients to the cost of caring for the cohort at large. Step five is to risk adjust the cost to calculate expected episode costs. And finally, step six, calculate the measure score. Now let's talk about attribution for both of these episode-based measures. For the acute inpatient medical condition episode measures, they're first attributed to the TIN billing at least 30% of the E&M services during the inpatient stay then to any clinician in the TIN who billed at least one inpatient E&M service during this day. Procedural episode measures are attributed to any clinician who bills the code which triggers the episode. So what should you do now? First of all, make sure that you are using the hierarchical condition category codes or HCC codes to identify those complex patients. Remember, this starts over every year. So ensure that you're documenting the diagnosis codes correctly in your patient records and on your claims. CMS considers comorbid conditions when calculating the cost of care for beneficiaries whose care and treatment are most complex. The cost measures are risk adjusted in providing the care to riskier patient populations will increase your cost benchmarks, but only if CMS gets the necessary claims data to reflect the patient's medical complexity. So next, you want to review your cost measures, your cost score for the quality payment program from 2018. Look closely at the costs associated with individual clinicians in your practice to better understand the clinical care decisions and make your necessary practice improvements. When you get your final feedback in 2019 in the summer, review your cost scores to see which measures you were scored on so you can be prepared for uh, making any changes for the rest of 2020. Review your cost data that you receive from other payers. On that note, you want to make sure that you're applying these same strategies and measures to all populations and all payers. Next, you want to look at preventive care for your patients. Your annual wellness visits, vaccinations, screening tests, all of these are crucial to keeping your patients healthy. Use those tools that you have available. If you don't have, if, if you have an EHR, don't just run a list of your patients, let's say, needing colorectal cancer screening, but rather stratify that list for those who are at the highest risk of colon cancer. Look at where you're referring your patients for tests and specialty services. Are there any lower cost options with the same quality of care? Work closely with care partners across the continuum, transitioning care, improving the communications, avoiding duplications of tests, so all of those are really important. 
Next, you want to make sure that you are um, considering your nurse practitioner and your uh, physician assistance you may have for chronic care management and coordinating care to overall lower those costs. Again, we talked about the patient relationship codes um, and making sure that those are added to your claims so that they can, those patients can be better attributed to you. And that is also an improvement activity new for 2020. So those are some tips that we have for you for what you can do now. Much of the information in this presentation is from the 2020 cost quick start guide listed first here on this resources slide. There are some other great resources for the cost category and general MIPS participation listed here. Please reach out to Michelle or myself with any questions you have. Here is our contact information. Thanks again for watching our presentation. Don't forget to check out our presentations on quality, improvement activities, and promoting interoperability also.